If you're cutting wet wood with your CNC, your project will end up looking like this. And no one wants their project to look like a potato chip. There isn't a lot of information dedicated to sourcing materials, so I thought I'd put together this video all about sourcing materials and five tips that you must do or consider when sourcing material for your CNC projects and products. Before we get into the list, I wanna tell you about andybirdbuilds.com. At andybirdbuilds.com, I've got all kinds of guides and project files and resources for the CNCer. So if you're just getting started, be sure to go to andybirdbuilds.com and check out all the resources we have there. And if you've been around a while, you should probably go check it out too. There's some new stuff there. All right, so let's get right into our list. All right, I put the biggest one at number one. Number one thing that you must make sure that you're doing when you're buying material, when you're sourcing materials for your CNC projects is make sure the wood that you're buying is dry. First, let's define what dry wood is. So dry wood is wood that is dried to a moisture content of eight to 12%, depending on the use. Eight is for if, the, if it's gonna be used indoors, um, 12 if it's gonna be used outdoors, um, so eight to 12%. So how do we tell if the wood we're buying is eight to 12% moisture content? Well, there are two ways. You could buy a moisture content reader, something like this one, where uh, it measures the moisture in the wood, which quickly there are kind of two different kinds of moisture readers. There's pinless readers that you just kind of sit on the wood, and then there's pin readers. The pin readers are a lot more accurate. But more importantly than that is the second option, and that is just to buy from a reputable hardwood dealer. This is the option that most people do. Most people don't have a moisture reader because good ones are expensive. Uh, so what does it look like to buy from a reputable hardwood dealer? Well, there are a lot of different options and they range. There's some na national chains, Woodcraft, Rockler, this isn't sponsored by any means, but those are some stores that have wood in stock. That is, is they're reputable, that's what they do. But every area is different. So I highly recommend looking, uh, researching, asking woodworkers, uh, CNC woodworkers or regular woodworkers, hey, where do you get your stock from? Where do you get your material from to build the things that you make? I've got a, a sawmill in the area. It's just a one person operation, but he also has a kiln. And so that's really important. He has a, uh, a, a large bandsaw, a large mill to mill up logs, and then he dries them all at his location. So uh, I encourage you, depending where you live, this might not be an option, but to look for um, those types of people or those operations in your area. But all of that in a nutshell, um, make sure the wood that you're purchasing is dry. Whether that's just asking the person, hey, is this wood dry? How did you dry it? There are two different ways to dry wood. One is naturally, and the rule of thumb is uh, to dry it outdoors, stickered, having space in between the slabs, one year outside for every inch of thickness. So if you're buying from someone that, that you don't know if they're reputable or not, you can measure the wood and you can ask them, hey, how long has this been drying? And if they say, oh, well, I'm not sure, or oh, it was cut two weeks ago, you're gonna know that was wet. So that's one way to tell. The other option I've already mentioned to dry wood is using a kiln. And that is the process of putting it in a hot area and it drastically speeds up the time it takes to uh, get wood dry enough to that eight to 12% mark to use. The second tip I have for you, especially if you're just starting out, is to utilize the Home Improvement Center. Obviously there's national chains here in the United States. If you're not in the United States, um, I'm, I'm sure you have some home improvement centers of some sort. Starting out with pine and cedar from the Home Improvement Center is okay. This is gonna drastically reduce the products that you can make with these. Um, to signs, to those silly pumpkin lanterns that I see everybody make. They make those out of fence pickets, uh, cedar fence pickets from the Home Improvement Center. By no means, do not buy hardwoods from the Home Improvement Center. If you're just starting out and you're gonna go get uh, oak from the Home Improvement Center, so, so expensive, you're gonna be like, how am I ever gonna afford this? Um, it's a lot cheaper to go to a reputable hardwood dealer uh, probably 25% of the cost. 
All right, the third tip I have for you is about Facebook Marketplace. Buyer beware. When I was first getting started, I utilized Facebook Marketplace. And one of the first projects that I made for someone else, um, a client I, I made, it, wasn't, it was a sign, it wasn't a big deal. Um, but I sent it to them. They contacted me like a week later and the, the project was like this, it, like, it warped up. And it was like an inch thick, but it was wet and I didn't know it. And it ended up looking like a potato chip. And that wasn't a good, that's not good, right? I still have wood that I bought two years ago that isn't dry enough to use. <laughs> so you can get good deals this way on Facebook Marketplace. That is the appeal. You're gonna be like, wow, I can save so much money. But if you can't use it or if it warps, then it was a waste of money. So it's better, it's safer. I know it's more expensive, but just go to where you know the material is good. With Facebook Marketplace, people necessarily don't know what they're selling. And if you don't know what you're buying, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. So I recommend staying away from Facebook Marketplace unless you plan on using it in two years or three years or whatever it is, or you get to the point where you know what you're looking for. The fourth tip I have for you is giving availability some thought. This really comes into play when you start working with on the wholesale scale. So let me try to paint a little bit of a picture of the wholesale and materials uh, because I ran into this quite a bit. When you're selling retail, meaning I make something and I sell it to one person. Once I sell it to them, I make it for them, they're happy, the sale's over with. They could come back later, but most likely they're buying one thing from me. When you're working on the wholesale level, that I talk a lot about on this channel, you need to make sure you have a source of materials that's reliable because they're buying at volume. And so one, you're going through a lot more material, but two, they're gonna buy again from you next month or next week or however often the goal is to keep that going. It's not just one order and it's over with. And the expectation is, is that your materials stay the same. The problem I ran into is like, there's a lot of different variances in maple. So there's silver maple and soft maple and hard maple. Um, the difference between hard maple and soft maple is there's a big color difference. And so I was buying, I was making maple trays and I was making them out of, uh, of soft maple. It's a lighter color. And then I switched my material um, supplier and I was getting maple, but it was hard maple um, or a harder maple, but anyways, it was a different color of maple. And the wholesaler that I was selling to said, uh, wait a minute, I, we want this lighter color. I had to scramble and find some more light maple, lighter maple, and I kind of talked to them and were able to go through the supply that I had. And anyways, it's just give it some forethought, uh, especially on the wholesale scale side. Is this material available? Uh, how much of it is available? What am I gonna do when it's not available anymore? Uh, maybe have an open conversation with the person you're selling to. I can only get this much of this. What do you wanna do after that? But that's, just give it some thought if you are, are looking to sell things at scale on the wholesale level. All right, the fifth tip I have for you is all about quality. Quality is something that's obvious, but there are so many things to quality, right? I mean, uh, checks, cracks, knots, bug holes. Um, one time I had a customer, a wholesale customer, send a bunch of material back that they couldn't use because it had little tiny bug holes in it. We didn't talk about that ahead of time. Another thing is pith. Pith is the center of the tree and it looks like this. I'll put a picture right up here and you can see. Um, you have to plane that out and get rid of all of that and you end up wasting a lot of wood. So, with quality, what I've determined for me personally, it is it's better to spend more per board foot and get a nicer board. Because what I found is if I start paying less, let's say I go on Facebook Marketplace and I pay half of the board foot I would have paid if I just would have went to one of these hardwood hardwood dealers. But what's happening is, and I have all the all the tools in my shop to mill down rough sawn lumber into final usable pieces. But what's happening, what happened to me is the lower priced wood was lower quality. And so I ended up milling away and wasting away a, a quarter of the stock that I bought. And then you have the amount of time and the wear and tear on equipment and changing blades 
and the mess it makes in the shop. So what I've determined is my perfect board that comes into the shop is rough planed on both sides, has one edge that's straight ripped, and that makes it really easy in my shop to run the other edge on the table saw and run things through my planer to put a finished plane on them. And that saves me time and it ends up saving me, saves me money in materials because I'm not wasting so much. Let me know down in the comments below what you've experienced while trying to source materials where you live. Because like I said before, this is different wherever you live. Sourcing materials can be a really hard spot depending on where you live. Um, but this is just one step of the product development stage. I've got this video right here that goes through all the steps of prototyping and gives you the best advice on how to approach that. So click this video right here and I'll see you over there in a second.